be talking about the impact that the Irish would have in say shaping Beverly Farms. So uh, with that, uh, Nancy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody. Okay. Who's, Irish? Who's got any Irish blood? Okay, okay. I have three percent. My husband has a hundred percent. So we pushed our kids over the fifty percent line. <laughs> um, I I, lo I love this talk because I love the stories, and so I hope you'll enjoy it too. Uh, I think when I grew up in Beverly, and Beverly Farms was where all those snooty people lived, and and went to West Beach, and <laughs> and I had no idea that um, if you talked about multifamily houses and uh, working class population, I don't think of Beverly Farms. But I should have. <laughs> so you'll see a little bit more about the other Beverly Farms. So that's what I'm talking about today. Um, the picture you see here is uh, Daniel Linehan, who I think is the fellow on the left with the derby, but I'm not sure. Um, and I don't know if anybody can see, but in the back, now. Uh, can you see the, can everybody see the little bathhouse here on the beach? Yes. With the, um, okay. Um, so this is West Beach. They're building a stone wall for um, the Moore Estate. And there's another bathhouse over here that you can't see. So this is after the turn of the 20th century. Not sure when exactly. All right, so. This is old Beverly Farms. Um, I don't know if you recognize where you are. How, how many of you are sort of familiar with Beverly Farms geography? And how many of you are not particularly? All right, I'll do my best. If you go down 127 and pass Endicott, by the time you get to, well, maybe by the time you get to Thistlewood and Prince Street, that's the beginning of what used to be called West Farms, and then be, later became known as Pride's Crossing. And then as you go, to keep going along 127 and get to Captain Dusty's Ice Cream, um, that still, in the old days, was West Farms, Pride's Crossing. And the major street that runs off Hale Street at that point is Haskell Street which was built in the 1870s, and that's the street I live on. And that goes from Hale Street to Hart Street at the other end. Um, so I'll try to keep you in the loop a little bit about where places are. So where we are now is on Hart Street. And this was, um, this is the original Baptist Church building, or the Baptist Church building that was there in the 1870s anyway. And this is um, Hart Street and the houses along Hart Street. And this is all still farmland. Haskell Street hasn't been cut through. High Street hasn't been cut. High Street maybe has been cut through. Um, it was a very small village. There was one general store, which was, I, do you know where the water fountain is? It's in Beverly Farms. Oh, yes, thank you. You have to remind me. Uh, just raise your hand if you can't hear. 
where the, it used to be a horse trough, it's a big round thing, that was the center of Beverly Farms. And across the street from that, there was a general store, Perry, Liberty Perry and Haskell. And they sold East India goods, which meant, included rum, I think. But um, Beverly Farms was really pretty dry. It was a kind of puritanical old Yankee village. Their library, their, their lending library, could not include any novels. It was put to be mostly religious works. Um, not very exciting reading, but maybe it was then. Um, so it was really the backwater. Um, in, the 18, in the 18th century, they even tried to connect to Marblehead, uh, excuse me, to Manchester, because Beverly Farms was so far from downtown Beverly. The road, um, Robert Rantoul wrote about the road being a very rough road. And imagine how cliffy a dirt road would have been between Beverly Farms and downtown Beverly. So here was the old Beverly Farms. And this is a map from 1852 called the Walling Map. There was a man named Walling who went around Massachusetts and New England making maps. This shows um, right after the train came in. But here's um, Hart Street. You come over here, here's the church. The only school was here on Hart Street. Um, there was a chapel connected to the church down here. This is Hale Street still. This is Mark Hale, but it's really west. And this goes off to Manchester. So you can see it's still not a very highly populated place. The, the empty places you see are tears in the map. <laughs> um, this, this is a copy of the original Walling map. That's, this is in the Historical Society. They don't have the original map. All right, so that gives you a little orientation, I think. Um, so there's, there's this church from a glass plate negative. And that was the, the school right next door. And then this was Perry and Haskell's store, later a house. And the community, old Yankee Protestants, Ober, Woodbury, Haskell, <coughs> Knowlton, Pride, Williams, Allen, a lot of names still there. Um, they were tradesmen and fishermen. The library would let people take their books to see. Um, they did, that didn't make quite enough money. A lot of people were shoemakers, and they had little 10-footer shoe, shoe shops in their backyards for the off-season. Um, pretty religious, religiously conservative, and definitely isolated by geography. Um, Robert Rantoul wrote about this community in some of his, in a couple, he gave a couple of lectures about Beverly, and he included all that I've just said about Beverly Farms in his lectures. Um, so this is, and he was writing those in the end of the 1830s. So in 1847, the railroad would come through Beverly Farms. And at this very same time, as all of you know, was the time of the Great Famine in Ireland. And this was the beginning of really massive immigration from Ireland. So that coincided with the railroad coming to Beverly Farms and the changes here. Um, so you can see pictures of evictions in Ireland and the great peak in immigration, but which continued really through the 1880s. It had a dip. I'm not sure where the, why the dip comes there. But something that you may not know, it might have been Civil War, but it looked like it was a little earlier than that. 52% um, of all Irish immigrants were women. Um, single women, mostly, who didn't have much opportunity in Ireland. If you, were, if you weren't married or if you weren't the firstborn, there probably wasn't much chance that you were going to get a husband. So. Many women came. So by 1860s, 80% of all domestic servants in Massachusetts were Irish. 
most of those women, but not all. 80% were Irish women, excuse me. Um, in 1847, the Eastern Railroad, I guess in 1845, the, instant, the Eastern Railroad, which came as far as Beverly, decided to extend to Gloucester. And in the extension, that meant they came through Beverly Farms. And as soon as they made the decision to run through Beverly Farms, rich Boston men, most of them um, board of directors of the Eastern Railroad, started buying waterfront in Beverly Farms and other places along the water. So the first people to purchase property for summer estates were Boston merchants and a few literati as well. Um, so this is not, not Beverly Farms, but it's a train similar to what the Eastern Railroad trains were like that came through at that time. That's a boy. <laughs> Um, a woman named Lucy Larkham Dow wrote a charming book called Old Days of Beverly, in Beverly Farms that was reprinted a few years ago. And this is what she writes. Mary Larkham, Mary Larkham Dow. All right, here's, here's what she wrote. That part of Hale Street where the Catholic Church is now was Miller's Hill, a pasture where I often tried to pick berries. The railroad came in 1845. That's a little earlier than I think it actually came, but the little shanties, oh, maybe they were starting to build it then. The little shanties where the laborers were, um, who were building the railroad, lived temporarily with their families, were a great curiosity. I used to run away and peep into them, and I can remember how they smelled. <laughs> Excuse me. Is coming over my eyes and not making this easy. My mother, who did the work of 20 women every day, almost as long as she lived, made knotted comforters for the shanties, these shanties. Our way of getting to Beverly and Salem was, large, was by stagecoach between Gloucester and Salem. So she, that's the only thing I've ever read about that. But they were probably Irish, because the Irish were the ones building the railroads in New England in, a, in the 1840s. Um, I don't have specific information about this one, but they were generally the people who were doing it. So they were the first, probably, to come to Beverly Farms, but they didn't stay. They were just migrant workers, in a way. <laughs> I can't keep track of all my, all my gear here. Um, Anyway, that book is available at the, from the library, and it's charming. All right, so the, the railway ran straight, and Hale Street was rerouted. So if you look at this, here's, this is the railway track. And this had been Hale Street. So here's Hale Street coming along, and it used to go straight down to here. And then, when the railroad came, it had to go up. But they, they don't show it on this map, but it came up, and it, when it came to Miller's Hill, it had to make a sharp cut down because they didn't blast through the hill. So it came down, and in the changing, some houses got left facing the railroad tracks. Have you ever been to Beverly Farms on the train? If you are, do, you'll see three houses that face the tracks which seems very weird, but they do. So once the railroad was through, wealthy Boston and Salem men seeking the country life came. The original houses weren't huge estates. Um, this one, the original estate was, the, the original house, I don't know whether it was this one or this one, but they just continued building on. This wasn't what it was originally. This was owned by a man named Franklin Haven who was on the board of the Eastern Railroad and bought up huge amounts of land. And this house, th this one has been torn down. This house still stands much changed. Um, if you remember, if, if you go to West Beach, there's a rock that's marked, marked 1620. <laughs> that happened in the 1950s, I think. Anyway, that house is still there, much changed. 
on that Haven estate in 1880, look at the servants. This is 1880 census was done in um, June, I think, and that's why all the servants' names are there. The servants came for the summer. So we, as a housekeeper meant anybody who worked in the house in that day. So every one of them are Irish. The early immigrants to the farms who came to Massachusetts during or soon after the famine were Lawrence Watson, a stonemason, who came in 1846 but originally lived in um, Boston somewhere. Stephen Conley, a farmer from Galway who came in 1848. Patrick Cullen, who was a stonemason, came before 1850 and is the only Irishman who was living in Beverly Farms who had fought in the Civil War. Who fought in the Civil War. Um, Daniel Linehan, laborer from Cork in 1855, and John Brady, farm laborer, 1857 or before. So these were early men who came not as servants, but as workers. John Brady purchased the old Liberty Perry house in 1861. This is one of the houses that had become the low rent district because they faced the railroad tracks. So this, this is one of the houses that faces the tracks. And that was John Brady's house. And the Brady fa there are still members of the Brady family living in Beverly Farms. The next year, in 1863, Daniel Linehan purchased the Pierce House, which was next to the Brady House. Now the house that he purchased was just this, and that faces the tracks. This is, I'm not sure who's there, I don't think that's, but this is Daniel, Lin, uh, Daniel Linehan and his wife, Julia. Lawrence Watson, who, um, who was the stone mission from uh, Roxbury, along with his wife Catherine and two sons, were tenants of the Linehans at the time of the 1865 Massachusetts um, had, had its own census. So Watson was a trained um, stonemason. I don't think Linehan was when he came. Um, in 1870, there was a decision made to move um, to build a new firehouse in Beverly Farms. And where they wanted to build it was where the, new fi where the current firehouse is, but facing West Street. And that was, the, uh, that was a house there, the, Ober, the Asa Obar house. And so the Asa Obar house had to be moved. So John, Lin so John Linehan, I mean Daniel Linehan, bought the Asa Ober, Asa Ober house and took, took it to his property and added it to his own house. So this is the original house, and then he added the Asa Ober house. He added it because he wanted more room for tenants. Um, Stephen Conley, who came from Galway, arrived in Pride's Crossing in 1865, but that wasn't the first place he was. Um, he had been, his brother, worked for the Lyman estate in Waltham and was apparently, even though he was a um, rural farm boy, well-educated because he worked for, as the Lyman's um, secretary and tutor to their son, which is quite unusual. Um, and he brought his younger brother, Stephen, to come and work on the Lyman estate with him. Um, Rich people stole each other's gardeners, <laughs> and, and um, so I think Charles Greeley Loring found out about Stephen Conley, who was probably an undergardener at the Lyman Estate, and hired him and brought him to Beverly Farms. And Stephen Conley and his family lived in this small house, which still stands much changed. It's the headmaster's house at Landmark and it's right next to the gym. And this is the Charles Greeley Loring House, which has since been torn down. That's the Lyman Estate. All right, Lawrence Watson bought this house 
1867. And this house still stands. Um, again, much changed. There are additions to the back of it. And it's quite close to the Beverly Farms Library across, the across Hale Street. So you notice he's working with himself and his son, John. So this is the farms in 1870, in the 1870s. And so you can see it's, this is still the most, this is Hart, and Hale, Hart Street and Hale Street. That's still the most populated area. Um, this is High Street, which has been cut through. Um, West Street has become more important, but, excuse me, where am I? Yeah, here's West, but not, I'm, I pointed to the wrong thing, but West Street really wasn't developed much yet. Um, it would eventually be because the railroad was there, but it still had very few <coughs> buildings. You can see the houses here, Brady, Linehan, and Rogers. There's another small white house right along the tracks here. I love this picture. Um, this is Jeremiah Linehan and his bro younger brother, excuse me, Daniel Linehan and his younger brother, Jeremiah. And I just got that picture and couldn't resist putting it in because they're so cute. <laughs> Um, William Leahy is my favorite character from this era. Um, he, he was, a, he was a, uh, a blacksmith in Boston and got persuaded by some of the summer people to move to Beverly Farms. And he was definitely a man of his own being. He didn't listen to anybody else. He did whatever he pleased. Um, and he had a black, blacksmith shop in the building that is now Captain Dusty's Ice Cream and has had many other iterations. I love um, special pains taken with interfering and overridging horses. <laughs> um, oh. What does jobbing mean? Odd jobs. Odd jobs, yeah. So I don't, I don't know what he meant by jobbing. Maybe coming to people's houses and doing little <coughs> blacksmith work. All right, this shows downtown in 1880. So here's West Street. You can see the fire station, engine number, a store, BSS is blacksmith shop. Stanley um, had a shoe shop, some, some kind of shoe factory, I think, a little beyond a shoe shop. But this is still farmland and just regular people's houses. Here's another blacksmith shop. And now the post office, which used to be on Hale Street, had moved down to be at the railroad station because the mail would come in by, by train. And this again shows that most of the people who live here are all still um, Yankees. By 1880, more Irishmen had arrived. So where were we going to house them? Daniel Linehan had seven family members and 11 male boarders. Lawrence Watson's house had five family members, two servants, and 16 ser um, boarders. So young Irish men lived with Irish families. Enter Daniel Leahy, William Leahy. William Leahy decided he would build a rooming house. And this fabulous building still stands. And this is the first rooming house that was built in Beverly Farms. And it was, and it's right across the street from the, Vine, from the fire station and Vine Street. It's a, a little bit to the right. It's a beautiful house. It's a beautiful, I glue it to my mouth. It's a beautiful house. It's still there. Still, it, now it's apartments. Lawrence Watson and his son John were st um, stonemasons and contractors. Daniel Lin Linehan and his son John were, um, were stonemasons specializing in landscaping and building fine avenues. But they were beginning to construct buildings at all. In 1884, Linehan had four, 20 laborers 
and all of them were certainly Irish. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with these buildings. If you come down Hale Street, these are within the um, landmark property. And these were built by Lawrence Watson. And it was the first time anything with this kind of stonework was done. So this is the, the barn and the greenhouse. And so have a look when you're driving down 127. Um, most of you probably have never seen this house because it's up in the woods. But this is the Commons, which is the only, I think the only house in Beverly Farms uh, designed by H.H. H. Richardson. It's up in the woods off Greenwood Avenue. And Daniel Linehan did the stonework. Now, Farmer Conley's sons um, got themselves into the building business. So by, by 1884, Stephen Conley, 24, and his 22-year-old brother, Greg, had a fledgling contracting business. Stephen had trained as a civil engineer, and their older brother, John, Tom, joined them as a business man, the business manager in 1886. It's interesting, Stephen Conley, as a child, had been dropped or fell from his high chair um, as a little kid. And I was somewhat um, crippled by it. And one of the summer residents kind of took him under his wing. And Stephen worked for him while he was in high school. And I think, I can't remember the first name of the guy, he was a Morse. Um, he sent, I think he may have sent Stephen Conley to school and helped him along a little bit. Anyway, the, these guys set themselves up as stonemasons and contractors. And their first job was straightening Hale Street. When Hale Street, when the railroad came through, as you can see, they didn't cut across Miller's Hill. The road came like this, then came right down to the railroad tracks and back up again. So this was, it was very awkward for driving. Now we're driving horses, of course. And so the, their first big job was cutting the road across here. And they, they got the contract, even though they were a very young company. Shortly after that, the Conley brothers bought ledge land and this is, you can still see the ledge. This is just as you start to come down Haskell Street. There's this small house and behind it you can see ledge. And if you look carefully you can see where it was cut, cut granite. In 1886, now they haven't been in business very long. They build this beautiful big house for their parents on the top of the hill off Everett Street. Now, Later, that house got moved, but that's where they built it. They built it big because the house, like all other Irish houses, was for the family and for tenants. And you can see that they also quarried the hill. This, these are quarry cuts. So the hill, this was up on top of a hill up here, and they cut granite from the side. In 1885, um, between 1885 and 1890, Beverly Farms decided to, or many people in Beverly Farms wanted to separate Beverly Farms from Beverly. Um, a lot of the impetus from this came from the summer people who felt that they didn't want to be part of this industrial city of Beverly. And the streetcars were streetcars with horse-drawn horse streetcars were coming in, and they didn't want those streetcars with riffraff coming into Beverly Farms, and so they gathered. They convinced the Beverly Farms, a lot of the Beverly Farms people, um, both old Yankee and Irish, that they'd be better off in a separate community. So the. Um, Division forces were very strong, and that's another story and another lecture, which I'd be happy to give sometime again. Um, anyway, 
since the Beverly Farms economy was really almost totally dependent, uh, independent of Beverly, except for Yankee boys who were going down on the train to work in, in the shoe factories in Beverly, um, they didn't end up succeeding. Um, and there's that same old picture showing that was still the center of Beverly Farms. Um, Beverly Farms residents overwhelmingly supported it. 282 male adults signed, 90 of them were Irish. Tom Conley and Lawrence Watson Jr. were active members of the division committee. So the Irish were following, following their, their, where their money was. Um, in the division census, um, there were 100 males over, over 21, 10 Irish homeowners, males over 21 in households. So in Dan Dan you can see all of them had um, tenants. And these were the jobs the Irish, had, Irish men had. So laborers, ledgemen were out working on the quarries, coachmen, farmers, gardeners, hostlers taking care of the horses, stonemasons, masons tenders, so all kinds of jobs. Mostly stonework and, and grading. My man, Daniel, William Linehan, was the only opponent, the only very vocal opponent. And so he's being, he's being satirized here um, in an Irish outfit in a donkey. Two that do not believe in division. Two hearts that beat as one. <laughs> the, um, the divisionists had a, their own newspaper. So William Lee, he's being lampooned here. And he, when he got up to speak in the meetings, they would all say, he's drunk, make him sit down. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And um, he soldiered on. He didn't give a damn. <laughs> um, there was also, even though women couldn't vote, they had their own petition. Um, and 44 of the 198 who signed were Irish women. Mary Linehan, Mary Conley, um, and you'll notice one, Mrs. R.J. McNeil. Uh, no, excuse me, Mrs. McKaig. Mrs. McKaig was a widow and who built her own house later. So she was a very independent woman. Single women signed as well. Um, John I. Baker, who became Beverly's first mayor, um, was one of the most prominent Beverly residents to speak against division. He didn't want Beverly, Beverly Farms had to become a certain size, or Beverly had to become a certain size to become a city. And if they lost Beverly Farms, they would, it would take them longer to do it. And interestingly, John I. Baker owned a lot of land in Beverly Farms, and, but he absolutely opposed the division. And Beverly Farms claimed, you know, we're just a quiet New England village. And we've got this big industrial place with all these immigrants downtown. So John I. Baker pointed out that Beverly Farms had more Irish immigrants than any other section of Beverly except downtown. So it's hardly a little Yankee village. Um, so it didn't succeed, but the division effort fostered continued growth and prosperity in Beverly Farms. People really had come together and just the, summer, the growth of the summer community, all of this helped Beverly Farms to grow. And in addition to our friend William Leahy, um, these two uh, hustlers, James and, James and Andrew O'Brien, who were fishmongers, built the first commercial and residential block in 1887. The O'Briens had a fish market in, Mar um, in Manchester and then built the building in Beverly Farms and opened a fish market here. I think originally they had a fish market in Boston. Where was the fish market in Beverly Farms? This, this building. Oh, okay. This is, um, which was, was later bought by the Coughlins and known as the Coughlin Block, was the first building built for commercial use on the, bay, on the first floor and apartments on the second floor. And this was the work of the O'Brien brothers. And they were, um, 
I can't remember, they had, I think they had a baby alligator in the window of their shop at one point. Um, and they were, uh, they were always going off sailing and doing all kinds of things. I don't think they ever lived permanently in Beverly Farms, but I think they had a, I think they, they lived in Beverly Farms sometimes during the summers. But they were real hustlers. Um, in 1885, St. Mary's priest, Father Ryan, asked the diocese for help. Um, the Catholic Church was, um, in Beverly, St. Mary's, was this church. It was an old Protestant church, and it was small, and it served Beverly, Beverly and including Beverly Farms and Manchester, and it was just too small. So, Father Ryan asked that an additional parish church be built in Beverly Farms to serve both the farms in Manchester, and it was. The decision to build the church was to build it um, up on, you see where it says cross estate. The, the road had already changed by then and cut through up above. And that whole area of Miller's Hill was just, a lot of it was just granite trash around the, around the road. Um, John, uh, Lawrence Watson owned some of that granite quarry up there and he gave it to the church. Eventually they decided it was better if they paid for it, but um, to, be sur to be used to build the Catholic Church. Is that St. Mary's? Pardon? St. Mary's? No, St. Margaret's. Margaret's. In Beverly Farms. Right, next yeah. to the ice cream. Yeah. yeah, this is the drawing of it. And it says, any person after the absence of two years from Beverly Farms um, who might return um, last Saturday and taken a drive from Prime Station to Pride's via Hale Street would have stopped in utter astonishment at the summit of the unsightly ledge located about midway between the two stations, which has been an eyesore to lovers of the beautiful nature for many years. And the transformation from ugly to beautiful is chiefly due to two men, Lawrence Watson, Reverend and Reverend W. H. W. H. Ryan. So it's, it is a beautiful church. And it was um, patterned after a church in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, Lawrence Watson did all the stonework on the church. I don't know who did the woodwork. This is St. Margaret's statue given by Daniel and Mrs. Linehan. Um, their son John and his wife gave the statue of St. Patrick. And then the windows were given by a variety of people. The church is interesting and in it's the only Catholic church I know of that doesn't have um, biblical stories, um, representational um, stained glass telling the stories. This, these are typical of the period, but not for Catholic churches. I think they must have been cheaper. I'm not sure. Um, so Daniel um, Reardon was a gardener, Irish gardener. Lawrence St um, Watson, you know. Patrick Brady, who owned the, um, bought the first house, was a gr grain dealer. William Ford was the farmer for Susan Cabot. So he was employed on a big estate. John Fay was also a gardener for one of the estates in Pride's Crossing. Well, those are all the same, that's interesting. They're not exactly the same. I, I don't think, these are, these are the same. Did they give them or actually do them? They gave them. I don't know who, I don't know who made the stained glass. Um, Edward and Mary McNeil, who lived in this White House that's still there near the church and for a while was the convent, um, had a tragic story. There are two children. Um, died of diphtheria um, a couple of years before the church was built. So they gave the window. This is the only memorial window, which was given in memory of their children. Um, there's a, the, people like to say it was the summer people who had the idea to build the church so their servants wouldn't have to be away so long on Sunday. 
The summer people certainly contributed to the building of the church, and I haven't been able to find out how much money, how much of the money they gave. But there certainly would have been a church re without the summer people. It might not have been quite as fancy, but there would have been a new church because the, the diocese wanted it. Um, <clears throat> domestic servants were strong supporters of the church. There were church fairs essentially run by the servant women, or at least a lot. And very shortly after fraternal orders, night, um, first the foresters, then the Knights of Columbus were found. Um, I don't know if they still are, but these, these fraternal organizations were insurance companies in a way, in that they provided insurance and care for working class Catholics. So it's interesting that St. Margaret's got both of these organizations fairly early on. 1888 was the first horribles parade on record. And the winners were Linehan and Reardon in that order. There's no evidence of what it included. Um, but that's the first documented parade. By the 1890s, the Yankees were getting anxious. <coughs> Conley Brothers had brought land for raw material and yard space. So Conley owned this huge section, part of which is now Dick's Park. Um, they also, and if you look, Everett Street, this is Watson, Conley, Davis, not Irish, McKean, McKaig, Conley. So this is becoming an Irish street. We got Lawrence up here, Lawrence Watson here, Leahy here, um, mixed among the Yankees. Then the, the, our, our friends, the O'Brien brothers, decided it was time to have something Beverly Farms didn't have. Beverly Farms had um, a kind of a meeting hall in the, over the drugstore on the corner, but there was nothing like a dance hall. So the O'Briens built this, um, Linehan did the stonework, and the O'Briens created this beautiful building called Neighbors Hall now. Um, the archways are, are now filled in, so you don't see that they're there. But it's still there, and it's still a beautiful building. So that was really the first that had um, commercial stores on the first floor and a big dance hall, function hall on the second floor. As it still, I, I don't know what's up there now, but for years that was the place in Beverly Farms. Yes, it's on West Street, um, but it's glassed in. What's now, and that's that building next to it is the old fire station. Um, Pardon me? Across from Dunkin' Donuts. Yes, yeah. Um, it's a beautiful building and became an instant success. So, yes? I noticed ladies' tickets, 35 cents. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ladies paid less. I think men had, to pay. I don't know if it says. Yeah, oh, I forgot that, yeah. Somebody found that in the wall of their house and, oh, gave, it, and gave me a copy. Um, they, the O'Briens had expected that rich people would use the hall. And I don't know that they expected local people to use it. But the firemen, um, some Scottish group, all kinds of groups had, had dances at the hall. And it became a real social center for Beverly Farms, which it hadn't had before. Certainly not for the common people. So this was another part of their really, the Irish really contributing to the built landscape of Beverly Farms. Then in addition, in the 1880, 1889-1890s, Watson Conley and John I. Baker sold off land and Lower Haskell Street near the Hale Street, near St. Margaret's, became an Irish neighborhood. So one of the Irishmen who lived there was Daniel Murray. Um, those of you who know, knew Faith McLaughlin or the McLaughlins, um, Daniel Murray was an Irish 
um, a state farmer with all daughters who all voted in the first time women could vote. <laughs> That's just an aside. Um, the Conleys had moved houses onto Haskell Street in the 1890s. They moved this Haskell house from Hale Street to the, to the site. It doesn't have a porch anymore, but it's still there and backs up to Dick's Park. The greatest, there were two of them that were great moves. This yellow house, which was the house the Conleys had built for their parents, high on the hill on Everett Street, they sold that property to an estate, uh, to somebody who wanted to build an estate there, and moved their parents' house down a steep hill. Now that's a big house, and that was moved by oxen or horses down the hill and then planted there. So now you've got two houses next to each other that are Irish houses. Yes, yeah, so is the old house here, is that the one right next to Dick's Park across from Goodwood? Yes, Orchard? yeah, yeah. Um, for a long time it was a um, Townsend house. Was it the original Conley house? No, it was, no, that wasn't a Conley house. Um, I'm not sure where Conley's, I, oh the Conley's, the old Conley's lived on the um, Charles Greeley Loring estate until the sons built this, I think. Um, but this one has the most amazing story. This, is, this house is on the corner of Everett and Haskell Streets. And it was the farmhouse, part of it was the farmhouse of, I can't remember his first name, but the same man who had, the same summer estate owner, Morse, who had befriended Stephen Conley. He gave Stephen Conley this house, to, which was the farmhouse on his estate, to move where he wanted it, wherever he wanted to move it, because he was going to tear it down. Well, he, people never tore him down. But this one had to be moved across the railroad tracks. So this was moved from the water side of the railroad tracks across the railroad tracks to its present site on which our first floor had already been built. So they added a floor and then set the other house on top of it. <laughs> um, Joan Johnson, who's here, who says Conley, her grandfather wrote a wonderful memoir and he describes that moving of the house. But he doesn't describe the building, the fact that there was a first floor built before it was put on. I don't know how they did it. But <laughs> The moving was done with horses and either lo logs, I think, um, slowly moving things down. But the Irish have now really taken over Haskell Street. It's, and, and, but not quite. There's still a few more, my house being one of them. Um, this is my house, the little blue-gray one, which used to be around the corner on High Street and was built there in the 1890s for an Irish family. Um, in around the turn of the century, or I, I think it was around 1910, um, the man who owned the house, who was, named, who was um, James Fanning, decided he wanted to build a three-family house. So he moved my house down to Haskell Street, built the house next door, And so we had a triple decker. His family lived here with their five, their, the, the, they were a family of, five, of six parents and four kids with three couples living in the, in the third floor. So 12 people lived in that house. Um, this is High Street. Peter, Peter Donovan and Patrick Barry bought houses on High Street so that they took over. Patrick Barry owned this yellow, bought this yellow house. Well, they're actually, they're both yellow. This is Patrick Barry. I love this picture. This is Patrick, his wife, a friend, and the Barry's little girl and little boy. He bought this house and then got this house, which was down on near Endicott somewhere, and moved it and slid it in right next to his house. 
So he now had two houses right together. So all of that has become Irish. Here's Everett Street, Irish houses, every one of them. A Watson house. Oh, this is Mrs. McCaig's house. She's the one woman who built a house. And that's her sign, her receipt. So there, there's her house. This was another, was a Conley house. This was another Conley house. So the Irish have moved in. And disgruntled old Yankees weren't happy. So they started something called the American Protective Association. And they were centered, actually, in the fire station. A lot of the firemen, old Yankees, were part of it. Um, I'm looking at the time, and it's 25 past 10. So I'm not going to read you a funny description about, it, about them. But if you want to hear it afterwards, I'll read it to you. Um, that's written by John Con by Joan's grandfather. That this was a national organization, anti-Irish organization. And I don't know how big the group was in Beverly Farms, but they were pretty powerful um, for a while. And eventually petered out. But there was a the, uh, the story. The story is about the fact that the um, the APA decided to they they put a cornerstone on a house, and everybody thought the cornerstone would have the date that the house was built. But when it was uncovered, the cornerstone said APA, and that was a house on Everett Street. It's covered up now, um, and I think it's the house that's owned by the Crosses, for anybody who knows the neighborhood. Ah, excuse me. Yeah, it's, I think it's this house. OK, Linehan, this is just to show what more of the built neighborhood was done by the, these Irish contractors. Linehan has built Sunset Rock, which was one of the big, beautiful estates that's partially demolished, but still there. Um, and then the Linehans, Daniel Linehan and his sons, Tom, um, Tim and, Dan, and Daniel and John, excuse me, Tim, Daniel, and John Linehan, all the original Daniel's sons, built beautiful houses on the corner of, of Hassela and Hale Streets. So they'd really made it. This is Daniel Linehan's house. He was a hay and grain dealer. This is his brother Timothy's house. Timothy was a blacksmith. These houses still stand. This one's up on the hill. Where? On the corner of Haskell and Hale Streets. So just as you come down Haskell Street, they're on your left. And this beautiful one is built, is the biggest one, was John, was John Linehan's. John Linehan was a very skilled um, stonemason and did some stonework at the Capitol in Washington. Yeah, see, I think they're all still in the family also. Yes. I don't, are they all? They yeah. Love the yeah, I, th I think they are too. Um, so the Gold Coast came of age and the Irish benefited by doing all of this work. So here's the work you saw in the very beginning of Linehan's crew working on the Moore estate. Um, in 1904, Conley brothers had 100 estate workers on the Moore estate. So both Conley and Linehan worked there. Linehan had 100 to 150 workers at the Frick estate, demolishing the old Tyson house and building foundations for Frick's house. Um, Conley brothers, Linehan and sons, needed labor. And they found it among Italian immigrants in Beverly. So after the turn of the century, they begin hiring Italians. And Lanahan's workers lived in a shanty in the woods where his quarries were. 
Conley's workers lived in near his quarry and their quarry and stone roof pressure on Greenwood Avenue. And that's the next lecture I'm giving. So you'll hear that <laughs> if you come. Um, they all, Linehan did the stonework on St. John's Church in Beverly Farms. Um, and Stephen Conley was a very interesting man and very talented. When, when rich people bought houses, they didn't want little bitty sap, saplings put on their houses, on their property. They wanted full grown trees. So Stephen Conley invented a tree moving machine that was used and had six foot wheels with huge steel axles and other parts in keeping with these. So they moved and transplanted to many of the big estates. This the is technology who, is still in use. Pardon me? The technology is still in use today. Ah, thank you. Here's just a group of Conley workers. They worked all over New England and into New York State. And the la one of the last big buildings oh, built in Beverly Farms was St. Margaret's Rectory in 1907, big public buildings. And that was the last work done by Watts and, son and Sons. Here's the Conley family in 1904, near their office. Oh, this is Daniel Gil Martin. Oh, more, more houses. Daniel Gil Martin built Beverly Farms' first three family. Um, and that was, he came from Boston, um, was a, um, he himself was a stonemason, and he decided having a three family house would be great. So he copied ones from Boston, and he was immediately copied by others. Um, here um, are the servants of um, Washington B. Thomas. I've included them because Jenny Flavin, a single Irish cook from Nova Scotia, built this house, the top, one at the top. So she was one of the first women to build a house that would be more than just a single family house. She had it, to, so she also could have tenants. And very shortly afterwards, <coughs> these two houses were built, um, both by Irish. <coughs> and this one, <coughs> these two are also on Haskell Street, <coughs> as is this one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the one on the right was built by a coachman. My, my. Yep. Built by a coachman who never lived there. He lived on the estate but he built this as an income property for himself. So that still stands, is now condominiums on Haskell Street. Um, Patrick Sweeney, who, who said she was a Sweeney? Or had a, okay, I don't know if you're related to this Patrick Sweeney. He was a sharp guy. Um, up above the corner of Haskell and High Street, there was a big carriage barn, big, livery barn, or I'm not sure if it was a livery barn or if it was used to store for horses to be wintered over from the big estates. But it was a big horse barn. Sweeney bought it and slid two-thirds of it down the hill and made this house. And this section stayed up on High Street. So he got two houses out of one barn. Uh, and James Fanning, I think I already told you this story, um, moved my house, which had been built on High Street, down here. And then on the vacant lot, built a three-family income house for himself. He lived back in this one. So they were still going at it in, 19, in 1909. This is the final building that was built by the Irish in that St. Margaret's School. 
and the Conley brothers used granite scrap. Remember, this is where the, the hill was blasted out. And they said they thought they could build it with scrap, and they did. So you can see that the size of the pieces of granite in the building are much smaller than usual. But this was the last, and if you think of it, that whole hill as you come into Beverly Farms is the Catholic Irish Church. Um, originally, one, there was also a, the convent, but the school, the church, and the huge rectory that certainly rivaled the estates of the very wealthy, much to the pleasure of the Irish. <laughs> so, I think that's it. Okay. So by 1930, almost every major public building in Beverly Farms had been built by the Irish. Most multifamily housing was built by the, for Irish owners. Irish customs and space provided by Neighbors Hall encouraged, enriched the social life. And then Irish contractors introduced Italian workers, which led to the development of a significant Italian community in Beverly Farms. So. I think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Have we time to, for people to ask questions? I mean, I, or do you need to stop? Oh, I mean, you can go as long as you want, Nancy. Okay. But a couple of questions, if you, and then okay. people can always come up and talk to you. And she will be back on April 22nd. Thank um, you. I can remember with date. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, does anybody have questions? Okay, yeah. Is the Archdiocese still on the, uh, the uh, rectory? That's the same I think so. <laughs> I, don't re oh, I don't really know. Yeah, what was the question if you just want to Oh, the question was, does the Archdiocese still own the rectory? Yes, they do. Do they? Thank you. I thought so, but I wasn't sure. What do they use it for? What do they use it for? I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. And if you have any further questions or want to ask, or if anybody wants to hear John Conley's story about yes. the, yeah. anybody who'd like to hear the, the story, you can just stay. I'm going to, it's, I'm going to read his words. It takes about eight minutes, I think. <laughs> okay, this is the story. You should know something about a movement in Beverly Farms during the early years the APA movement, the American Protective Association as it was named. So is this working now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, was organized for no good purpose. <laughs> its chief function in life was to spread religious hatred. This organization, from what I saw of its action, was a first cousin of the Ku Klux Klan. It's unknown what the membership of the APA organization in Beverly Farms actually was. It was secret. However, the so-called front men numbered but four individuals, all known to the population as the leaders of the movement. Mr. One, Mr. Three, and Mr. Four all were residents of Beverly Farms, and Mr. Two a resident of Pride's Crossing. One early summer evening, a few members of the organized group from Beverly Farms and Pride's Crossing met for the purpose of laying a cornerstone of a building. The northwesterly corner of the foundation wall was ready to receive the cornerstone, which had previously been cut by Mr. Four. The cornerstone ritual having been exemplified, the stone was set in position. The members present then placed and bolted the wood sill to the foundation wall. Now it was, assured by, it was assumed by townspeople that the cor cornerstone was to record the year the building was erected. After the building was completed and the outside grading began, it was then discovered that the cornerstone, instead of noting the year of the erection, bore the inscription APA. Shortly after this discovery, a young man, then a junior in college, later a prominent attorney in Boston, for the purpose of aggravating Mr. One, determined to obliter obliterate the cornerstone and inscription or to deface it in such a manner as to bring ridicule on those responsible for the placement and the thought which prompted their action. 
The following story was told to me by the man who years ago was guilty of wiping the cornerstone with green paint. This is his version of the procedure that he followed to complete his self-appointed mission. Equipped with a goodly supply of paint, green paint, I on my bicycle and under the cover of darkness made my way from Cross Crossing to the building, applying a heavy coat of green paint over the face of the cornerstone, then removing a previously inserted wooden plug from the bottom of the paint container, I remounted my bicycle, riding slowly in order to leave a trail of green paint. <laughs> I proceeded to Pride's Crossing. Arriving at my destination at the foot of the steps of the homestead of Mr. Tu, going up the stairs with the green paint trail still dripping to the front door. I considered my mission had been successfully accomplished. The container and remaining green paint I discarded in the open field beyond. <clears throat> what seemed to please the painter most in reciting the above story to me was the consequence of his act which took place the following morning when Mr. One discovered that his cornerstone had been smeared with green paint and having had his attention called to a trail of paint leading northerly along the sidewalk, he in a burst of temper and with murder in his heart proceeded on foot to follow the green paint trail which ended at the front of his front door of the, his close friend and APA associate Mr. Two. He lost no time in ringing the front doorbell, which was quickly answered by Mr. Two. Mr. One immediately accused Mr. Two of being guilty of painting his cornerstone. Of course, Mr. Two denied it. A fist fight started, ending with Mr. Two as the victor. It was the painter's opinion that his act and the battle which followed the next day between the two of the top leaders of the APA movement was in great measure responsible for the death of the APA movement in Beverly Farms. The cornerstone, the cornerstone was quarried, cut, inscribed, and set in place by Mr. Four, Four, who for nearly 30 years was employed by Conley Brothers as a stonemason. Had he performed the service at the direction of an employer, I would not feel ill of him. Them, of him. However, having pilfered the raw stone from Conley Brothers' quarry and fashioned it in the basement of one of the Conley rented properties, silently and unknown to anyone save him, save his APA friends, was, in my opinion, the act of a very disloyal and unappreciative employee who over the years was the recipient of many kindnesses and gratuities at the hands of the Conleys. Mr. Three was a part-time painter and call fireman attached to the farm's firehouse. He enjoyed a nickname of one of our many early spring wildflowers. I have no idea what it was. I keep thinking maybe it was dandelion. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, that's the story. And thank you very much for coming.